And so if you're wondering what you're doing for lunch, uh, you don't have to worry anymore. So we'll do that uh, after the service. So keep that in mind too. And they'll be back in the fellowship hall. Um, we're gonna we'll put this, we're not gonna keep it in the bulletin, we're just gonna keep it before you, but again, the church grounds fund, we did um, starting that just to kind of help upkeep some of the uh, items going on outside. So if you'd like to help donate towards that fund. Just like just like Ray brought the gravy. <laughs> yeah.
Here, their most basic physical, emotional, and spiritual needs are met. By teaching them to stand in God's strength, they move forward with courage and grow in their faith until their comfort is to the point of where they can begin to realize and deal with their problem and move forward in the Lord. Thank you for your donation of $125, and that's what we give each month. May God bless you and your heart to help your generous giving, and your faithful prayers. In his service and yours, Mike McClure. So again, remember Mike at Good Samaritan Ministries, and they're certainly close by, and uh, they can always uh, use their help, uh, and especially our prayers. Thank you.
words. It's a never-ending ride on a runaway road. You're a permanent passenger, tied down, buckled up, chained to your seat. The menacing vehicle snaps you at abrupt corners. It jerks you up to impossible summits. It propels you crashing down incredible valleys. It's anxiety. You're trapped. The more you worry, the more helpless you feel. God knew that anxiety would do this to you, and that's why he said, don't worry. Come to me and rest. In other words, trust me. It's the only way to hit the brakes and bring anxiety to a halt. That was my life the last month. <laughs> when, uh, when my Darlene tested positive with COVID on May 6th, um, I was concerned. I was worried. And I was immediately, the first thing that immediately came to my mind, I thought about my troop of friend, the last 45 years, Howard Cook, lost his wife to COVID last uh, fall. And another friend that had been a motorcycle friend for years lost her husband. And I just kept thinking about that. And I was concerned because I couldn't fix it. I didn't know what toolbox to go to. And anybody that knows me knows that it doesn't make any difference what it is if it's broke. Granted, it's physical. <laughs> and I just couldn't do that. We contacted Darlene's primary care as she got worse over a couple of days. And primary care would not give her a prescription on the telephone wouldn't let her come into the office. Well, you can't come into the office because you've got COVID. But I can't give you a prescription over your phone. And I cried out to the Savior. I said, Lord, I need you and I need her. And granted, you can't fix it. So please help us and help this respiratory issue and my prayers were answered. Fine. Almost immediately, we found a place to go that the doctor would see her. The doctor gave her the antibiotic that she actually requested. She started that and within hours started showing improvement. And that very afternoon, shows up on my telephone. And that afternoon, my verse for the day was Isaiah 41 10. It said, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And let me tell you, from that moment, Amen. all was good with the world. Amen. God is good all the time. Pam Thumb uh, did a song several years ago, and I hope it blesses your heart. It's called Life is Hard, but God is good. Amen. <laughs> The world is good. 
I was thinking about that too, even in uh, Sunday school. Uh, whenever Alan was talking about <coughs> what we have in salvation, and just it's more than that, and, and how that there's going to be trials. And who knows what's right around the corner, even for each one of us. Um, even though we're believers, um, we're not promised a bed of ease. And, but anything that we go through, even in this life, is far better than what we deserve. You sure. can say that. Well, we're going to be in uh, Judges chapter 16 today. Judges chapter 16. And here, this is basically the, the whole account here is talking about Samson and the story of Samson. And we're going to begin in verse uh, 20 of this text here in Judges chapter 16. 
and read down through the end of the chapter. And um, here, right, just kind of a little bit of introduction there. He, he, there under verse 18, it says again, Judges chapter 16, this is back up to verse 18, a little bit more context. It says, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines. And by the way, the Philistines were the enemies of, of the Jews here at this point. And notice it says of the Philistines saying, come up once more, for he has told me all of his heart. And what they were, she was pretty much just trying to figure out what was giving him the strength that he had is what it was, came down to. And so Delilah was uh, sent basically to charm uh, Samson and to be able to try to figure out what was his strength and what was the basis of it uh, to be able to tell the Philistines and the enemy. And so that's basically the background. So it says, come up at once for he has told me all of his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. Then she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, Gaza and they bound him with bronze, fetter, bronze fetters, and, uh, and he began, or became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaken. Now the Lord of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, the God, or their God, and to rejoice, and they said, our God is delivered into our hands, Samson, our enemy. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God is delivered into our hands, an enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multi multiplied our dead. Let me pause here just for a second. Sometimes we think that and we can, we can be kind of, it can be very dangerous even in our circles to say God is behind something, and sometimes he's not at all. Right. Notice here in this text what it's saying. They think that you know they're praising their false God because he supposedly is the one that delivered Samson into their hands. It wasn't that at all. It was actually them bribing Delilah to be able to, for her to go and do what she did to got to this point. So it wasn't their, their false gods that did it. Um, moving along, verse 25, so it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. So, so they called for Samson from the prison and he performed for them and they stationed him between the pillars. Then the Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, because he was blind at this point, let me feel the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. Again, these are all of the Philistines inside. Uh, and, and the lords there, verse 27, and the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which uh, supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of his father, Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. So here we have this account. And here we see that in, in the end, 
the biggest aspect here, or, or Samson's failure, was the failure of relying in God solely. He was looking to other individuals, other things, other than God himself. Came across this illustration. It says, when Benjamin Frank Franklin was seven years old, a visitor gave him some small change. Later, seeing another boy playing with a whistle, uh, young Ben Franklin gave the boy all of, his, all of his money for it. And he played the whistle all over the house, enjoying it, until he discovered that he had given four times as much as the whistle was worth. Instantly, the whistle lost its charm. As he grew older, Franklin generalized this principle. When he saw a man neglecting his uh, family uh, or business for political popularity or a miser giving up friendship for the sake of accumulating wealth, he would always say he pays too much for his whistle. And you think about that, and we need to be careful in our own lives that we don't give up what's best for a whistle that's not worth it. Of things in our lives that basically are not pleasing to God, which in the end is not worth it at all. This is exactly what's happened here in, this, in, in Samson's life at this point. And here we're going to look at a couple different aspects here of, of this situation, and, and hopefully we can glean some lessons from this for ourselves uh, out of this text here this morning. First of all, we see the potential of Samson's life. Let's back up to chapter 13, Judges 13. Number one, he was extraordinary in his birth. He was extraordinary in his birth. Here, the birth of Samson was announced by a visit from the Lord himself. Notice here, Judges chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, uh, down to verse 7. Uh, Judges chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, it says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for forty years. Uh, now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And again, this is, this is basically the Lord using this angel to be able to bring this about and show them exactly what's to happen. In verse 6, so the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was was like the countenance of the angel of God, very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. And then notice in verse 7, And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. And then if you notice in the same chapter, down in verses 24 and 25, it says, So the woman bore a son and called his name Samson and the child grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at uh, Manah Dan between Zorah and Eshbal. so once again here the Lord was moving the Lord was working in his life at this point so here he had an extraordinary birth he also he was extraordinary in his accomplishments Samson is remembered as one of the strongest men of the Bible you know, we might think as men, it's pretty kind of neat carrying our kids around. Here's Samson pushing pillars and killed over a thousand people uh, here at this one moment. His, we see, first of all, his energies. Notice in chapter 14, notice in verses 5 and 6. Don't you have to really turn. Uh, it says, but his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at the time the Philistines had dominion over Israel, 
Um, it says, so Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Um, and uh, now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And then notice verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. Though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. And can you imagine just killing a lion like it was nothing? And But here, notice, who was the one that gave him the strength to do this? It was God. God was the one to do this. And that you can't get away from that fact, that God was the one that's continually working. Notice also he performed many other great feats with his strength. Notice in chapter 15, beginning in verse 4, it says, Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes. I mean, you see some of these, you know, fox hunts, and they're, they're on the trail, all these horses and everything else after one fox, right? right. Notice here in this, in this verse, he says, um, he's, he's after, uh, there in verse 4, he went and caught 300 foxes, and he took torches, uh, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. When he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the uh, shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyards and olive groves. I mean, it's, Peter would not like this story. But you can imagine, the, I mean, exactly. And what was he doing? He was also it shows how smart he was, right? Here he went and burned down all of all uh, everything that the Philistines needed for food. That was what, exactly what he was doing here. Notice he goes on and he says in verse six, then the Philistines said, "Who has done this?" And they answered, "Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion." So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. So here we see the energy is going on in verse 7. Then he goes on and says, Samson said to them, since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you. And after that, I will cease. Go on into chapter 16. There's some 16 in verse 3. It says that Samson lay low. Well, let's back up for um, Context in verse one. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. When the Gazites were told Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, "In the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him." And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts and pulled them up. And bar, uh, bar and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. So here we see his strength. We also started to see some things here too about his character, though, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Notice there in, in verse 1, it says, Now the Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. Here he's having sexual relations here with this harlot. This was not pleasing to God. And, and, you know, that's a danger for our lives, too. Not necessarily maybe that particular sin. But you think about that. Maybe in our own lives we can start getting prideful. Maybe in who we are. Maybe what even ultimately what God is doing in our hearts and lives. But maybe we're starting to take credit for that. That's exactly what we see starting out here with Samson. Here he's strong. I mean, he's, he's you know, getting all the attention. And he's taking advantage of that and not in a godly way. So it's very, very, very good point here to be able to stop him and see in these verses how he's starting to lose focus of what God's point was for his life. And he's losing. So here we see his energies, we see his enemies. Samson was always battling ultimately the Philistines and to prevent them from capturing control of Israel. Um, he killed 30 Philistines at one time. Notice back in 14, uh, in verse uh, 19, it says here, uh, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and, Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men 
uh, took their apparel and gave the change of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So he ate, so his anger was aroused, and he went back up to his father's house. So here in this, just one particular episode, here he kills 30 individuals. Another time he killed a 1,000. Notice in chapter 15 and verse 13. It says, so spoke to them, saying, no one, uh, or no, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into the hand, into their hand, but we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Leah, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And again, don't gloss over who's given him the strength. It's God. And the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand, and took it and killed a thousand men with it. That's amazing. I mean, you, you know, I mean, you think about if you, if you watch shows or different uh, films on a uh, Medal of Honor and those types of things, some of the exploits that men do. But here, just this one man, and this isn't with some huge machine gun, this with a, a, a jawbone of a donkey, kills a thousand men. But again, who gave him the strength to be able to accomplish that? It was God. So here we see the potential here. We see also here his extraordinary accomplishments. It goes on. We see evidences as well. Samson proved he was a man of God by the power of the Holy Spirit that was resting on him. It wasn't just the exploits that he was doing that pointed people to God, but it was God himself working through Samson. Just like Samson, the child of God, lives an extraordinary life. We're redeemed from sin and we're dwelt by the Holy Spirit. We're privileged ultimately to be God's child. And how many times do we sometimes neglect that? Or maybe that we take pride in our own selves in what we're doing, even if it's in the, for the cause of Christ. That's a danger, even if it's for Him. And ultimately, we know that it's only the Lord that gives us totally the strength to be able to accomplish anything for Him. Secondly, we see the problems here of Samson's life. Uh, as a great as Samson's strength and potential might have been, he was a man faced with many spiritual problems. Number one, he faced uh, powerful adversaries. Notice back in chapter 14 here of Judges. Notice in verses 1, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. You can stop right there, right? Why? Because it was the daughter of the, of the Philistines. The Philistines were their enemies. He had no business going down there. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah, the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. And by the way, this went against totally under uh, Jewish custom anyway. Normally, it was the parents that actually uh, were the ones that actually uh, proved and gave the wife to the husband. It wasn't necessarily just him going down and picking her. Notice verse 3. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? They had some common sense, right? And they also realized that this was actually displeasing to God. And he goes on and it says, And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. But his father and mother did not, not know that it was of the Lord that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at the time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother, and he came to, came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily against him. And here we see this episode again with the lion. But here, first of all, we see not only the adversaries that he's um, coming across, but then also we see even with this, with these verses, Samson may have battled the Philistines for over 20 years, but his greatest enemy was Samson. 
That's actually who his greatest enemy was. His own flesh, his only flesh, fleshly appetites proved to be his undoing. Flip, if you would, over to James chapter 1, just for a moment. James chapter 1, along with this thought in mind. James chapter 1. And let's uh, begin in verse 12. And it says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires or lusts and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Notice verse 16 where it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. So once again, here, this is some great thoughts for us as well, isn't it? We need to be extremely careful. So it's not only face powerful adversaries, but also powerful attractions. Going back to Judges chapter 14, notice at the beginning of verse 8, it says, After some time he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there for young men, um, for young men used to do so. And so here, even in these verses here, uh, we see that again, him, his was the life to be dedicated totally to the Lord. And here, even in these verses, we're seeing how that the Lord was even providing for him. He was showing Samson that, that God alone was the strength for Samson. He didn't have to look anywhere else. Looking back in Je uh, Judges 13 and verse 7, it says, And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And again, drink nor wine or similar drink, nor eat any unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. This was God's plan for him. He was showing him all, all along, not only that he was not only giving him the strength, but that he was his child. And he was to be living his life solely for him. There's a word here, some words here. Notice in um, one other uh, text is in Psalm 32, Psalm 32. And here we need to be careful because ultimately the going of our own way ultimately leads to sin. Psalm 32, notice in verses 1 and 2, it says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And then it, notice in verse 5, it says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Now here's David. Of course we know the sin of David, Bathsheba. But David was repentant. He came to the Lord asking forgiveness. We see even in these verses, and, and uh, the title of this psalm here, at least in my Bible, is titled, The Joy of Forgiveness. And as we come before the Lord, and as we realize at times, and at this point we see how that Samson's life is starting to go downhill. And, and at moments he's not actually focusing on what all the Lord is doing. The Lord's showing him time and time again, even with giving that honey, that he's going to be his sole provider. Where does his strength come from? It's not in anything else but in the Lord. 
And he's giving him opportunity after opportunity to be able for him to see this. In spite of his sinfulness, God's still wanting him to return back to him. Also, he faced powerful addictions. Notice going back into Judges again. Uh, Judges chapter 16. Going back to the verses 1 and 2, we, again, we go back to this thought as far as with, with the harlot. Samson, by the end of his career, seems to be living a total lifestyle of sin. That's sad. And ultimately, it's a besmirch upon God. Why? Because Samson was his chosen servant. And here we see him living for himself, living his life not for God at this moment, but he was actually living for himself and his own pleasures, his own desires. And he's reached a place where he treats his testimony like a trinket or like rubbish. That's what we're seeing. Verse six, chapter 16, really from verses 1 all the way down through verse 18, we're really seeing this all played out. We also see that the product of Samson's life we see the losses in his life, the context of his sins with Delilah. As a result of his sins, he suffered some pretty significant losses. Notice, go back to chapter 16 here, if you've if you, uh, turned it all. And let's look at verse 21. Here, Samson, first of all, lost his vision. Samson lost his physical sight. Notice verse 21 says, Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to, to Gaza. And they bound him with bronze fetters, and he began uh, became a grinder in the prison. He's just basically grinding out grain. This is this mighty Samson. This is where he's at at this point. He's blind, and what's he doing? He's grinding out grain. So he's lost his vision. This is all he's doing. Secondly, he lost his vitality. Here in the same. Same verses, notice verse 20. It says, And he said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out before as other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. There's some verses in the Bible that should just reach out and just grab us at moments. And this is one of those. Whenever he says this, at the end of verse 20, where he says, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Why? Because I think he'd been trusting in himself far too much. And notice what his response was. Well, I'm just going to go out and basically beat these Philistines like I always do. And what was the problem with that? He was not relying on God. God and, and notice, and ultimately it says that at the end that the Lord had departed from him. And we, if you stop and think about our own lives, would we even know if the Lord had departed from us? Because we've just been doing things in our own strength at times, or maybe far too long, instead of trusting in Him for the results and understanding that He's the one that gives us the ability and and the the willingness to live our lives out for Him. So here He lost His vitality, and it's not just physically. Spiritually as well. He's losing everything. And here's this strong man this, that, that I'm sure there was no one in the world that was likened to him at that moment or probably ever. You think about probably uh, Goliath, but you think about Samson. Also, he lost his victory. Notice there at the end of verse 21, same verse. It says that the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, and they bound him with bronze fetters and became, and became a grinder in the prison. Here he had lost his victory. This is the same man that had killed thousands of Philistines at a time. And here, this is what he's been basically uh, set to do at this moment. Why? Because ultimately he had forgotten God. So, what are the lessons ultimately that we can, from this text, that we can say, that, well, you know, that's a sad epitaph on Samson at this moment. And really, in the end, it's sad even in his death. Why? Because it never had to happen. 
If he had been trusting in God all along, obeying God's will all along, and not just what he thought was the right thing to do with his life, he probably would have been in the strait that he was. He probably would have made, met the end as he did. And here are the lessons for we would, three different ones just in conclusion here this morning. Number one, a lesson about ridicule. Samson is ridiculed by the enemies of God. If we must endure persecution or ridicule, let us do so only for the cause of Christ and not because of foolish and sinful living. That's, that's ultimately what we need to remember. If people are going to make fun of us, it better be because we're living for Christ and not just for stupid things that we do in our lives. Notice a couple different texts on this. First Peter, let's go to First Peter. First Peter chapter four. And let's begin at verse twelve. And it says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. You know, is it isn't that amazing? Like even as believers, sometimes you're like, you know, Lord, I, I'm your child, you know, what what are you doing? Why is this coming down on me? But notice what these verses, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You know, isn't that true? Yeah. If things didn't happen, they would basically upset our lives at moments. We would never trust in him. There would never be any real cause for joy. If, if you were, and this is may seem like a silly maybe illustration, but if you lost your key, right? If you have your keys in your pocket, that's great. You don't even think about it, right? If you lost your key, then you know what you've lost, but then you find it. Isn't there a lot of joy there? And you wouldn't have, you don't appreciate that key until what? Until you lost it. Here in this, is sometimes we don't really appreciate what we have in the Lord until maybe we're not where we should be. And then the Lord convicts us, and we're like, wow, there should be joy in that restitution of Him. And then He goes on here, and, he, and He's, First uh, Peter chapter 4, notice again, He goes on down in verse 13, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that. When his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. We well, may not look at it that way, but that's how he says to look at it. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Notice. So if we're going to suffer, here's how not to suffer. But let not one of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. I, every time I read that verse, it's kind of, to be honest, a little humorous. I mean, he's talking about murderers, right? He talks about murderers, a thief, an evildoer. But then all of a sudden, who does he lump in there? A busybody in other people's matters. Why? Because his doing is just as destructive. A murderer is killing someone, is destroying their life. What is a busybody doing? The very same thing. And probably countless others. And as far as that goes, that many more people are affected. And then it he goes on and says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, as a Christ-like one, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin where? At the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let us, or let those who suffer according to the will of God, commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. Some powerful verses. So we need to be reminded in ourselves 
of, of hey, you know, people are going to uh, ridicule us, and they're going to, you know, for, for living, you better be for living for Christ, and for no other reason. And then also, uh, look over in uh, Matthew, backing up, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. talking about the Beatitudes, and right at the tail end of all of the Beatitudes, notice here in Matthew chapter 5, notice verses 11 and 12, it says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Notice it's not just falsely because of you, but it's for my sake. And then he goes on in verse 12, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And they did. A lot of times, you know, we're going through Isaiah, but <clears throat> people didn't like Isaiah either. And ultimately, what were they not like? They didn't like what God was having to tell them. That's what it really came back down to. And, and people don't like what, what God has to say. Nothing different in our age. God is, the people don't want to know anything about God. They don't want to know what God's word says. They, want, they, they laugh at it. They think it's ridiculous. Why? Because they're living for themselves. But then notice what this is. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And how does the Savior respond? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. It's hard to do in the moment, right? Yeah. When people are maybe making fun of you or whatever. I mentioned that. I think the worst that's ever happened to me out visiting and door knocking or whatnot by people in church, somebody spit on me when I was a teenager, but that was about the extent of it. So, I mean, overall, I think we've had it pretty good. But, it, but all around this world, it's not that case, is it? When you think about this, you know, it's, as I mentioned earlier on at the outset, it's far better. Anything we go through in this world is far better than what we deserve. Yeah. What do we deserve? An eternity in hell. That's what we deserve. So any type of mockings, you know, scourgings, even at the point of death, how long is that going to last in the scope of eternity? That's what we have to keep in mind. So we have to remember what all we're being ridiculed for, and better be for the cause of Christ. Also, there's, so there's a lesson there of ridicule, also a lesson about repentance. Before he died, seems to make things right with the Lord. However, he did it when it was almost too late to salvage anything, right? It was really, it was a no-win situation. He really backed himself into the corner. There was literally no other way out of it. But he did respond and ask the Lord for his forgiveness. And the Lord gave him the strength to be able to do that and, and make, make that one last stand. But before we were forced to pay the ultimate price for our sins, repentance could take place at any time. And here's really the, the, the real lesson in that. We shouldn't wait till the very end whenever we're in a real strait because of our sinfulness. We should be living our lives for Christ because it's what we should be doing all along. Because we have a heart and a, and a love for Him where we realize what all He's done for us. And then we serve Him out of, out of gratitude and not out of pure duty. And then there's a lesson about restoration. Samson received his power back from the Lord and whatever we may lose to sin, in a spiritual sense, the Lord can and he will restore it if we come to him. That's the, that's the grace and the mercy. Even as a believer, sometimes we stray. Sometimes we're not living our lives as we should for our God. But there's hope. And he has restoration if we'll come back to him. So here in conclusion... We don't have to pay the price and the high cost of ultimately low living in sin. Just like Samson, he went and did a lot that he did. And now he thought it was all probably for God's glory, but it really in the end it wasn't. It was for Samson's glory. And it cost him dearly. But just like the prodigal son, if you're not where you should be today with the Lord, there's hope. You can come back to the Lord's will. If you're here this morning, don't know the Lord is your Savior. 
There's never been a time when you've understood that, hey, I mean, I'm, I'm a sinner. Every one of us, every person that's ever been born in this world was born a sinner. And we all need a Savior from those sins. Jesus Christ is the only one that can not only forgive you those sins, but give us a new life. And it's not just to get to heaven, but so we can have the blessing of knowing him as Savior here, as Lord here, and serve him here. And then it won't be any shock and awe when we get there. Why? Because we've been living a life for him all along. That's his plan. And, we, and again, this is a great lesson here this morning of, of even in the life of Samson of a man that was born, that was given um, everything he needed to be able to please God with his life. But yet how often and how um, unfortunately we see how that even in Samson's life and even in our own lives, if we're not careful, we can go astray from what God's will and purpose is for our lives. So once again this morning, we need to be able to be reminded that how that we need to be close with God, not just even weekly, but daily. Right? Because Satan just doesn't attack us on Sundays. He attacks us all the time, right? So we need to be careful of looking to the Lord in every aspect of our lives every day. Let's close in a word of prayer and as we look to our invitation time. And uh, during this invitation time, you know, this is another game, great, great opportunity to be able to come before the Lord if there's, if there's sin in our hearts. Um, the Lord's not going to be able to use us. He's not going to be able to we're not going to be able to live for him as we are unless that's restored and that's, that's forgiven. And even as his people, we need to be reminded through these accounts. And even during this invitation time, come before him, thanking him um, for his mercy, thanking him for his word, uh, where we can see how that we are to live for him. Father, we thank you so much for God just for your word this morning. Thank you. Even for these accounts, sometimes they're not the easiest to read, they're not the easiest to talk about. Thank you, Father, how that we have them and, and their grand illustrations of how not to live our lives for you and also how to live our lives for you and what's pleasing and what's displeasing to you. So we just pray, your Father, this morning that you would just do a work in each one of our hearts. I pray, your Father, you'd help us to draw closer to you uh, each day. Every morning that you wake us up, Father, I pray that you help us to be dedicated to living for you and pleasing you more. I pray that you during this invitation, you just have your way. I pray again, if there's one here this morning who doesn't know you as Savior, that you would draw them to yourself, your Father. That you do that work, help them understand that you need to be a Savior for your people. I pray, your Father, that you would just continue just to encourage each one to live their lives for you. And ask these things in Jesus' name. Would you please stand during page number 118. 118, near to the heart of God.
God and not to forget. Not to forget. You have so many illustrations throughout your word of individuals who've forgotten. But thank the Lord that we've seen individuals who've forgotten you and restored in you. And I pray, your Father, today you would help us to continue to submit for you each day to give to us. I pray you'd help us to realize that all the strength that we have is not in ourselves. Father, you help us to rely upon you each day to get to us. We ask these things.